wanted to invite Jeremy to come forward this morning, and I, we don't normally do this, but I want to pray for him. So uh, when I uh, preached my first sermon, I was shaking in my shoes, so to speak, and it is a, a, a fearful thing in one sense, but mostly because you're handling the Word of God, which is a wonderful thing to be called to do, and I think you're called to do it. So if you will, let me pray for Jeremy in this exercise, and you guys can also pray with me for him. And then we'll be blessed with your first sermon. And when you become a great and famous preacher someday, we'll all say we were there for the beginning, right? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of Jeremy. I thank you that he has moved from St. Louis to come down here and to begin a youth ministry and to bless this church as he helps us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And we pray for him as he brings your word before us this morning, and we ask that you would help him to say exactly what you want him to say and help us to hear exactly what you want us to hear. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. I want to begin this morning with just a moment of gratitude. There's so much to be grateful for that I figured might as well start with that. Uh, First of all, I'm so grateful to God for giving me this opportunity to be here at Central Church preaching his word. If you would have told me a year ago that I would be preaching a sermon in Jefferson City, I would have just said, let me worry about my wedding that's in the summer, and then we'll get to that later. But God, he orchestrated this entire thing, and I'm so grateful to him for that. I'm grateful that you all are here this morning in person. Um, It's a great thing to be in the community of God and share that fellowship with one another as we get to worship our Father. And thank you to those watching online as well. Uh, There's so much content that is out on the internet, and I'm so grateful that you are here to study God's Word with us this morning. And lastly, a bit of housekeeping. As many of you may know, I do tend to sway a little bit here and there, um, so I hope that none of you get motion sick this morning. If you do, we do have some Dramamine out in the narthex, so please feel free to get up and get that. So I'm going to begin by reading God's word, and then I'll pray, and then we'll dig into the lesson for today. The word of God comes from Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 33. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others still one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after the third day, rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Here ends the word of God. Thanks be to God for it. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May the meditations of our hearts be centered on Christ. Let our hearts be softened to your word and be moved by your spirit, most gracious God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Growing up in St. Louis, it's very evident that St. Louis is a sports town, and the biggest sport in St. Louis is the St. Louis Cardinals. If you were living in St. Louis or around St. Louis, at a bare minimum, you're at least a casual Cardinals fan. Almost every single person in St. Louis has a Cardinals shirt, Um, they have a hat with the birds on the bat, and opening day around there is basically a holiday that everyone celebrates and everyone looks forward to. I see a couple nods from the congregation who are Cardinals fans. And with professional sports, especially the baseball teams. There's the minor league teams where there are less developed players. There's so much excitement around these younger players about what their potential is, how high can they go, and what is their ceiling. 
you get to see what they're able to do against other young players and gauge how good are they going to be. What is this person's potential? Are they going to end up being an everyday starter? Are they going to be just a bench player? Or are they potentially going to be a future Hall of Famer? This reminds me of a trip that I ended up taking with my family to Springfield, Missouri, where we got to watch the Springfield Cardinals. And it was a great trip. Uh, we went with my dad, and he was hyping up this specific player, Dylan Carlson. And I was so excited to see him, to see what this player could be and think about all the ways that he could impact the Cardinals. I remember at his first at bat, the first pitch that he saw, he swings the bat and hits a home run. I and my dad, we were both ecstatic because we knew that this Dylan Carlson could be the future of the Cardinals. Now, if you follow the Cardinals, that's, I don't want to talk about the Cardinals season right now, but Dylan Carlson, he's, he's doing a little better. Uh, the speculation of these minor league players is kind of similar to the conversations and controversies that we see surrounding Jesus in the day. So let's turn our attention back to the text for today. Verse 27 and 28. Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others still one of the prophets. The population at that time, much like Cardinal's nation, is following Jesus. They're watching what he does to see what he does and how he acts, and they start seeing who he might be. They say, maybe he's John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist, he made the Pharisees mad. Jesus makes the Pharisees mad. They could end up being the same person. At this time of this reading, John the Baptist has already been beheaded. So maybe they were thinking that God was able to take John off the injured list and insert him back in so that he could preach God's word. But Jesus is not John. Maybe Jesus is Elijah. Elijah was taken up into heaven before dying, and he was prophesied to come back and again continue to preach God's word. But Jesus is not Elijah. Now, maybe Jesus is just one of the other prophets. I mean, nothing special about him. I mean, there's a lot of things that's special about the prophets. They are called by God in order to spread his word to the nations. But again, they're, they're not something big, something spectacular. Maybe Jesus is one of the prophets. He'll be just a fourth outfielder. Maybe he'll have one or two years in the spotlight, and then after that, he'll kind of go back to what he was doing before. Maybe he'll be like Amos, where Amos was a shepherd before, and then he comes preach God's word for a couple years, and then after that, he goes back off to shepherding. Maybe Jesus will end up, after preaching for a little bit, continue being a carpenter like his father was before him. And then Jesus changes the question. Who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Messiah. Now, we as Christians, we're probably back here applauding Peter. Yes, that's the right answer. Good job. I imagine this with the family feud. Good answer. Good answer. And it is correct. Jesus is the Christ. So in the passage, it says Messiah which is also translated as the Christ. And let's dig into that a little bit now. Christ, the meaning of that is the anointed one. And so what does that mean? Anointed means chosen by God to do his will. But there's a difference between the anointed one and an anointed one. An anointed one could mean a lot of people. The priests, they were anointed. Aaron, who was the first priest back in Exodus, he was anointed and he was to carry out God's commands with his people. The kings of Israel, they were anointed. Saul, the first king, David following him, he was anointed as well. So how did Peter come to the conclusion that Jesus was the anointed one, that he was the Christ? They must have been thinking about this for some time, Peter and the other disciples and those following him. They were speculating and asking themselves, who is Jesus. There's a specific time earlier in Mark where they ask this question to themselves. They're in a boat, and the wind starts to blow in, the waves are rising, and the disciples, they're terrified. They wake up Jesus, and Jesus, being the good God that he is, he calms the storm. And we read this in Mark chapter 4. This is God's word. 
he says that they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So the disciples, they know a few things about Jesus. They know that he can heal. He heals the sick with just a touch. He's able to heal the paralyzed by just saying a few words. Get up and walk. We've heard that he's able to feed thousands upon thousands with minimal resources. And as we just read, even the winds and the waves obey him. We also know that Jesus speaks with authority. He had authority and he spoke with it. Mark chapter 1, verse 22, very early on in the gospel. God's word says, The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now Jesus, whenever he got up to preach, he wasn't just making weak contact with his teachings. Whenever he was on the mound preaching or in the synagogues, he would step up to the plate and he would crush it out of the park. So then this brings us back to the question, who is Jesus? So we saw that he had power and authority, and the disciples, they knew ancient scriptures. They must have been asking, is he the anointed one? They probably had a little checklist that they were following. They knew that Isaiah said that the Messiah would come from the line of David. Okay, so they know that. Check. Got that off the list. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. All right, check, got that. These prophecies go all the way back to the first book of the Bible in Genesis, at the very beginning of humanity. These words from Genesis chapter 3. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is talking about whenever the serpent is tempting Adam and Eve. And the serpent is successful in doing that. God prophesies that he is going to send someone in order to crush the serpent's head. And to, but the serpent is going to bruise the man's heel. Bruise, strike, depending on the translation, um, they're the same meaning. So the disciples must have been thinking, okay, he's going to, if this is the Messiah, the one prophesied from long ago, he's going to get a bruised heel somehow. Maybe he's going to, while walking, sprain his ankle or something. So we'll keep an eye out for that. But after the checklist, Peter has gone down, checked all the boxes. He proudly proclaims that Jesus is the Christ. Can I get an amen? Love it. This is the prospect that everyone has been talking about that is going to bring about a new dynasty for the organization. Not just some prophet, not just a long reliever. He's going to win World Series after World Series. He's going to be the king. He's going to be the one to free us from Rome and redeem the people. Peter proudly proclaims that Jesus is going to save the people. Peter admits that Jesus was chosen by God. He was a priest, a prophet, a king. But Jesus is not just a priest, a prophet, or a king. He's not a priest like Aaron. Aaron, he fell into temptation. The people of Israel wanted someone to worship, so he built a golden calf, which we should worship no one but God alone. Jesus is not like King David, the greatest king that Israel has ever had. He does not fall into the temptation of pride and adultery. He doesn't need a messenger from God like David did in order to tell him when he does wrong. So this brings us back to the question, who is Jesus? Yes, He's the Messiah, the anointed one. He's the priest that's going to uphold God's standards, the prophet who's going to proclaim God's word, and the king who's going to rule with justice and mercy. He's going to redeem the people of Israel. But he's going to do more than just redeem the people of Israel. He tells the disciples what he's going to go through in order to redeem. He's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected, and he is going to be killed. And when the head of the serpent is crushed, the devil is going to fight back with all he can. They're going to mock Jesus. He's going to be beaten, and he's going to be stricken. Satan does all he can do. And at the end of that, in Mark chapter 15, after Jesus has died, we hear a centurion say, after Jesus died, when the centurion 
who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. So more than a priest or a prophet, he is the Son of God. More than redeeming just Israel, he is going to redeem all of humanity. So now that we know who Jesus is, we're going to get into the part of the text of how Jesus is going to do this. How is he going to redeem Israel? What is the strategy? Is he going to bat lead off? Is he going to bat third? Is he going to teach in Galilee for a little while longer? Is he going to send some letters out to different cities that he's already preached in? Maybe him and the disciples, they'll do the divide and conquer method. Jesus already sent out the disciples before, so maybe they'll do that again. I know all the disciples, they probably had their strategy of what was going to happen. So let's hear what God's strategy is. In Mark chapter 8, verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Huh. That's a little confusing, a little counterintuitive to what we might think. Four chapters earlier in Mark, Jesus says that we are supposed to be a light. From Mark chapter 4, he says, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So the disciples are thinking, this is an interesting strategy, Jesus. A couple chapters earlier, you just said to be a light, but okay, we'll continue. Let's hear what the strategy is. So then, this is where the fun begins. Then, Jesus begins to speak plainly to them. Here are the words from God. Verse 31, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now we must be thinking, great, he's going to rise again. This is fantastic. He's going to defeat death and the devil. This is absolutely amazing. But the disciples... That's not what they hear. They hear that Jesus is going to be killed. This is heavy stuff, brothers and sisters. We have the advantage of hindsight. We know that he's going to be killed and that he's going to rise again. But think about the disciples. This is the teacher, the one that they're proclaiming as the Messiah. They've been following him for a long time, getting up every morning and going in whatever direction he says. And these are the things that is going to be said about him, that he is going to suffer and be rejected and to be killed. They left everything to follow Jesus. And this is his plan, to be killed? How can he redeem Israel if he's dead? David wouldn't have been the greatest king if he was dead during his reign. Solomon wouldn't have been able to build the temple if he died early in his reign. So Peter, being the smart one of the group, he realizes the flaw in Jesus' strategy. So Peter takes him aside, and he says to him, are you sure this is a good idea, Jesus? I mean, this is not telling people, like, didn't earlier you say, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear? But hey, we'll let that one slide for now. But to die? you have to be able to come up with some better strategy than this. Sure, you can bat 7th or 8th or even ninth, but to not even be in the lineup? Jesus, you are the Messiah, but you can't be the Messiah this way. Let's think about this for a second, the irony of this. Peter just proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the one who is anointed by God to do his will. And then he says, no, Jesus, we're not going to follow your plan. Peter has his own agenda that we're going to follow. Peter is putting Jesus into a box, the Messiah box of what he expects him to do. Sure, you're the king, but here's what we're doing. You rule over everything, except for this little bit. And how does this apply apply to our lives, brothers and sisters? Where are we putting Jesus into a box? Sure, I come to church on Sunday morning, and I pray before meals. 
I even, every once in a while, I listen to Christian music. And Jesus, you work your magic during that time. But all the rest of the time, I have my plan. I know what I'm doing. I gave you your time, Jesus. Now it's my time. Or there's this ministry that I'm involved in, and we have a meeting tonight, and we're going to begin with prayer. And Jesus, during that prayer, you work your magic. You do whatever you need to do. But after that, I have my plan for what we're going to do. I have my plan for how we're going to spread the gospel. How that can be misguided, brothers and sisters. How we can have our own agenda. And while it has good intentions behind it, it does not truly have the intentions of God behind it. Peter says that Jesus can't be the Messiah this way. Then Jesus makes a strong statement in front of all of his disciples. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Wow, that's powerful. Peter just admitted that he's the Christ. And now Jesus is calling Peter Satan? So how does that work? What did Peter do? How is Peter aligned with Satan? How has Satan been influencing Peter in this way? Again, Peter had good intentions behind this. But what is the root sin behind all of this? These words are recorded in the Bible. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Human concerns. Peter's concern is that redemption isn't happening the right way. Brothers and sisters, where are your concerns? I know for me, my big concern is how am I going to be perceived? Leading up to this sermon, I had so many thoughts flying through my mind of what am I going to say? How are people going to perceive the words that I'm saying? I'm because I want to preach the word of God, but I also want to be fun. I want to keep people entertained. I mean, I am the youth director, so got to have some fun in me. But I also, you know, have to be respectable. I have to be able to be trusted by everyone. And so these concerns were going through my mind day and night. Often, going to bed, it was the last thing that I thought of. We go back to some of the scriptures that were read earlier today. Deuteronomy chapter 11 said, Fix the words of God on your heart and mind when you lie down and when you get up. Psalms 1 says, Meditate on his law day and night. When I was preparing for this, was I meditating on his law day and night? Or was I concerned about the human things, about how I would be perceived? Brothers and sisters, let me bring your attention to the last scripture reading that we read today, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. There's some joy that we have in this, brothers and sisters. We have been raised with Christ. The story doesn't end where Jesus gets killed. But no, we have the redemption. We have been redeemed because of Christ's actions and because of Christ's love. And now, we are called, being redeemed, to set our minds on things above, to set our hearts on things above. As I mentioned earlier, going to bed and waking up, those are two of the hardest times for me. There's so many things going through my mind. At night, it's, what did I do today? How is this interaction with this person? Who do I still need to text tomorrow? Whenever I wake up, I think, okay, do I need to go downstairs to get a pair of socks from the laundry? Who do I need to text today? Does Noelle realize that she's taken the entire blanket? But all those things, again, these are merely human concerns. How different would it look if I woke up with God's words on my heart and on my mind? So, brothers and sisters, I want to end you, end this sermon with just a couple of questions. I ask you to look into your heart, to ask yourself, who is Jesus? Is he the one that I'm going to fit into this box? The one where I'm going to give him this time, I'm going to pray before meals, Sunday morning, maybe I have my devotion in the morning, and Jesus has that time. 
Or is he the king of everything, the ruler of all time, every single moment of your life? Is he the one that is in charge? And so now, knowing who Jesus is, how are you going to respond? What's your strategy? Are you going to meditate on his law day and night? When you wake and when you go to bed, when you're walking and when you're sitting, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to listen to God's law, to listen to where he is calling you to go, but to remember the joy that you are raised with Christ. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, like Peter, we ask that we proudly proclaim that you are the Christ, that you are the risen Son of God. We ask that you give us strength to carry out your law. We ask that you speak plainly to us to guide us in the ways that we are to go. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we have the privilege of being able to come to the Lord's table, celebrate communion, but when we do that, we always recite one of two ancient historic Christian creeds. Today, we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed together, so I will invite you right now to join with me in reciting this Pledge of Allegiance to our God. Will you do that this morning with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one holy and universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray as a gathered people. Heavenly Father, we know that many of our hearts are happy this morning, enjoying the warm weather, the springtime, uh, the joys of life. Yet we also know that many of our hearts are heavy this morning, that we have things on our minds that are troublesome to us, that we think about the things we've lost, the people that we love, whom we are not with this morning. There is a heaviness on many of our hearts. We are a, a gathered people who come from many different places, emotionally, spiritually, physically. But you are the God of comfort, and we come to you now looking for that comfort. You are the God of praise and honor and joy. And so we look to you now for that joy that you bring into our lives. And we say thank you. But Heavenly Father, you are pleased to meet with us when we are low or when we are high. You are pleased to meet with us no matter where we're coming to you from. And we thank you for that. Uh, this morning, as every Sunday morning, we remember those who are unable to be with us that are watching online right now, and we lift them up to you and we thank you for them. They are our brothers and our sisters in Jesus Christ. And there are many, perhaps, who are even watching this service whom we don't know. And we love them too. We care for them because Jesus cares for them. And we thank you for them right now. Uh, we invite them to come and to join us on a Sunday morning if they're able to come. And Lord, we ask for your comfort to be in their lives. We ask for your 
praise and your honor to be exhibited in their actions and their minds and their spirits. And we do all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who has gone to the cross for us, who has conquered death for us, and who asks us now to honor us fully with our lives. And we close this prayer in the way that he called us and taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if you're visiting with us this morning, we're thankful that you're here. We want this service to bless you. Uh, we want you to have a great worshipful experience here. We do not want you to feel as if you need to put anything in the offering plate. But if you are a member of this church, then this is part of your worship. We don't pass the plates here, but we do have plates at the front and at the back. And if you want to uh, contribute your act of worship through monetary giving, that's the place to do it. I would just also say if you have prayer requests, you, you can put those on a piece of paper and you can seal those up and drop them in there and I'll get those and I'd be glad to pray with you. If you want to meet with me, uh, or with Jeremy. He's probably smarter than I am. You're welcome to do that too throughout the week. We'd love to have you. So if you want to meet with us about something, that's a time to do that. You can also put those asks in the offering plate. We're so thankful that you're here. The offertory scripture this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. Paul writes this, For if the willingness is there, the willingness to give, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. God is concerned that you deal with what you have well before him, and you worship him with it. He is not concerned with great riches or with poverty in the sense that you give less or you give more. He's concerned with your heart. And I pray that all of us would approach him with a heart that is longing to give to him Right now, I would encourage you to ready your hearts and your minds uh, for communion this morning. It's going to be done a little differently because I don't have a wireless mic. Our wireless mics are both down right now. Do not worry. We're getting new ones probably this week coming in, so it'll be okay. But I'll have to come over here in order to be mic'd and, and to do the institution of communion. But take a moment before you approach the Lord's table... And recognize that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then this table is for you. You don't need to be a member of this church. You need to be someone who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ and longs to follow him with your whole life. And if that's where you're at, then this, this table is for you. Jesus invites you to this table. And I'll invite the ushers right now to come forward this morning. Hold on to the elements, and we'll all take at the end together.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In a similar way, he took wine, and he poured it into a cup. He said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. When you approach Christ's table in faith, when you remember, as he commanded us to remember him and his work on our behalf, when you remember him in faith and you take that bread and you eat it and you drink that wine and you recall what Christ has done for you, when you do that in faith, the promise is that as far as east is from west, so Christ has separated your sins from you. And he's given you his righteousness. Amen. Let's pray and thank God for that. Most gracious Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. We thank you for it, though it is a sober meal to participate in. It is a blessed meal. And we look forward to that great day when we will sit at the wedding feast of the Lamb with our Savior and eat 
again of a celebratory meal with him, but one that will have no end. We thank you that we have been made righteous in Christ through faith, and we ask that all of our lives would be an acceptable sacrifice of worship to you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, will you stand now for our closing hymn? receive the benediction from Acts chapter 20. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Amen.